Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. And this is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. Happy Monday. Hey, happy Monday, Beth. The pollen is out here. I meant to tell you that oh, earlier. <laughs> I we saw this in my uh, Instagram story. Somebody else was like, the pollen fever is here or I don't know, whatever. I was like, oh, yes, it happened. <laughs> don't miss that, I bet, about living here. It is. Yeah. Literally ridiculous. Pollen fog. Pollen fog, people. Pollen fog. That's what it was. Oh, yes. I do not miss it. It was like snow on your car. Yes. Like literally. <laughs> literally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it rained. And so it's going to be worse. Anyway, no one cares about that. Mm. Okay. Um, <laughs> I care. I'm yeah. hacking and my eyes itch. I care, but nobody right. else. Um, okay. I want to tell you, I was scrolling on the talk the other day mm-hmm. and I saw this thing about Anna... Delvey, do you remember mm-hmm. her? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Inventing yeah. Anna. That was the name yeah. of the documentary, right? So this is the girl who was like a con artist and she took a bunch of money from people and made up a fake identity and millions of dollars, right? It was a lot. Mm-hmm. Like completely defrauded all these people. So she got arrested. She got prosecuted. She is out. Right. Mm-hmm. And on house arrest in okay. like the East Village. Oh, she can't leave her house. They gave her a reality show. Shut the front door. From her house in the East Village. It is called Delvey's Dinner Club. (laughs) Isn't that terrible? She's now making money. Profit on being this crazy con artist. Maybe they're hoping if she makes some money legitimately, she will stop conning people. (laughs) <laughs> That's not even her name, and it's called Rehabilitation. I don't think that should be allowed. I think that they should have said she was not allowed to profit off her crimes, which well, maybe yeah, it's no. not going to be about her crimes. I don't know. The what? real question is going to be if we're going to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Just talked about how we watched some really stupid crap. <laughs> Well, it's kind of it, it's kind of a what what are we saying like community service because, to watch you them? know to watch it because we watch it and then we let you know like oh <laughs> well give it a shot right they're not worth it <laughs> I don't know we're gonna hmm. watch it we are totally what, what uh, <laughs> what's it on I don't know that oh. one, it didn't say on the TikTok but I'm sure I can find it yeah um. Also, I meant to say this. We've given away three books in the last couple of weeks. And okay. um, so that's been fun. And I just wanted to say congratulations to the people who won the books because we weren't like uh, po- like posting about it. Well, yeah. One was on the regular feed and two were on Patreon. Oh, that's so, right. So, so yeah. So see, I mean, patrons, you get, you get books over there. So that's fun. Yeah, exactly. And only the patrons were entered in that one. Yes. Because they were the only ones I heard the story to. So. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, let's see. Let's see. So, yeah, her name's not even Delvey. Her name's like Anna Sor- Sorokin yeah. or something like uh-huh. that. Yep. I don't hmm. know who it, where it's going to air. Well, we can figure it out. <clears throat> anyway, so that's crazy to me. It is. It and. Is. Yeah, we just were talking about the Murdaugh documentary. We're going to start that, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We should do that one same time. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Although I tend to watch things like real fast. But there, there was only like three episodes, I think. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. So we could knock that out real, real easy. But right. anyway, that's all I have. You know what? It's funny when you said you were scrolling the talk and saw that. I, you know, when I scroll the talk, I tend to go right past all the crime stuff. <laughs> really? Wait, yeah. So do you look on our TikTok? Yeah. Like our, mm-hmm. okay. Oh, because Yeah, but I, I go to like the comedians. Yeah. Right. More than I like the crime stuff. I mean, sometimes if they, if they start right away and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I'll watch it, but most of the time I'm just like, shoop, 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 straight to the community. I would say that's true of me also. But mm-hmm. this, I sh- it said Anna Delvey, and I was like, oh, what about her? I didn't know uh. she got released. I didn't even realize she was not still in jail. So 
I think I knew that part, but mm-hmm. I didn't know what the terms were or anything like that. Like, anyway, house arrest, baby. Wow. Well, interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out and we'll start watching when it <laughs> <Yeah>. starts. <laughs> we know. Stay tuned. Anyway. Well, okay. I have a crime. Don't scroll past me. <laughs> yes, please don't. <laughs> okay. Here it comes. Well, wait, but before you get started on your case, we almost forgot we have our anniversary surprise. Oh, that's right. Three years. Yes, we're doing three years um, live. We're going to do a live, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're um, going to go live and we're going to record an episode, but you'll be able to watch us record live over on YouTube. Yes. So if you don't follow our YouTube, go and follow our YouTube so that that's done. And it's the 29th of March. Yes. We're going to, in the evening, go live from our closets. Mm -hmm. Or basement. On a Wednesday night. Basement. (laughs) Closet. Guest room. I'm in my kid's room today. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Anyway, there's that. Okay. And I I believe our link to our YouTube is on our um, link tree, but I'll make sure it is after this anyways, but this way you know where to find us. But there's not going to be a link to like the show because it's just going to be us going live on that channel. So that you'll just We would love for you to join us. I think there's an option where you can write us questions Mm -hmm. or comments and we will do our best to get some of those. And yeah, you can see us in the flesh. Yeah. Woo-hoo. It's going to be cool. I'm going to have to do my hair. Anyway. Me okay. too. <laughs> All right. Back to a case. You ready? Yep. All right. Here we go. Okay. You probably could hear me whisper that at the beginning. <laughs> I don't know if I take it out or not. <laughs> All right. This case comes to us from our listener, Audrey. And we are going to Alabama to the city of Auburn. Gosh, that's lots of A's. It is. Audrey from Auburn, Alabama. (laughs) Where the college is? Yes. (laughs) Anyway, thank you, Audrey, for this case. Okay. Auburn, Alabama, because I looked Mm -hmm. it up for you, is in the eastern part of the state Mm -hmm. near the Georgia border. Thank you. You're welcome. It is also home of the Tigers, like you said, Mm -hmm. which is Auburn University. It's a very quiet, safe Southern college town. Okay. And in this town, we are going to talk about the case of Lauren Burke. And how safe the town is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. It's sad. Lauren Ashley Burke was born on December 30th, 1989, making her a Capricorn. Mm -hmm. She was born in Marietta, Georgia, to parents Hmm. Jim and Vivian Burke. Very familiar with Marietta, Georgia. Yeah, we actually have family in Marietta, Georgia. You do? Yeah. Huh. I only know that because I wrote Christmas cards to them this year. And you were like, oh, Marietta. There it is. Yeah, that's exactly (laughs) what I was like. There it is. Mm -hmm. There they are, living there. She had a sister and a brother. So there were three kids in the family. Lauren's parents did divorce, but they co-parented their three children very well and had a great relationship. And Lauren had a very close and loving relationship with both of her parents. Oh, okay. Lauren was raised in the Jewish faith. She was an absolutely beautiful young lady, like for real pretty. She had dark hair and dark eyes. She had a gorgeous complexion. Lauren's friends described her as being well-liked by everyone. She was kind. She was always smiling and laughing, and she loved to just be happy. Mm -hmm. She was athletic. She had a lot of friends. In high school, Lauren met a cute Southern boy named Sean, and the two of them began dating. They were very much in love, so when it came time for them to choose a college, they decided to go together. And both chose to attend Auburn University in Alabama, which was about two and a half hours from their hometown. 
Okay. They graduated in the spring of 2007 and made the move to Auburn and started college that fall. Lauren majored in photography and marketing and was planning to have a career in photography. She became a member of a sorority and she played lacrosse and she lived in an off-campus residence hall. So like perfect college experience. Right. Yeah. Sean, her boyfriend, lived in an on-campus dorm. And despite their young age and the transition to college life, they actually stayed together and remained very happy and very much in love, which honestly probably tells you a lot about the type of person that she was. Right. Yeah. That like That's not easy to do in college yeah. in general, especially like a big college. You're like, whoa, what? this is a whole different world. Mm-hmm. You know? And you're so. in a sorority and you're playing a sport and you're 18 and you've never lived away from home. It's like, there's a lot going on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they were very in love. In March of 2008, the two of them were actually planning a super fun trip for their first college spring break. They were going to West Palm Beach, Florida. Oh, I used to live right there. Yeah. (laughs) On Tuesday, March 4th of 2008, Lauren woke up and had breakfast with her boo at a coffee shop on the campus. She then went to class. That afternoon, she called her dad to check in and she told him about her plans for spring break. Like, super excited about this trip. Me and Sean are going on. She wanted to tell you about it. She then went back to Sean's dorm on the campus, and they hung out for the afternoon. They took a nap. They did, you know, whatever, hangout stuff. Lauren had a study date that night at 830 with her friend Michael at the camp, the on-campus library. Mm, okay. So around 8 o'clock, she kissed Sean goodbye. She left his dorm to walk to her car, get her books, and then she was going to drive to the library. To study. Mm-hmm. But Lauren never showed up for her study date. Uh oh. This was very odd to Michael. So he called Lauren several times, but the calls kept going to voicemail. Eventually, Lauren did pick up the phone and she sounded like she was in her car or in a car. And she just quickly told Michael that she had forgotten about a birthday dinner for one of her friends and that she'd have to cancel their study date. So sorry, got to go by. And hmm. hung up abruptly. So Michael said, yeah, I did think it was odd, but nothing scary. Like it Mm -hmm. wasn't a red flag. It was just like, oh, Lauren's blew me off. But in hindsight, it really should have been a red flag to him. Like it it really was out of character for her and odd. Mm -hmm. But at the time he just was like, well, I guess I'll go home. Around nine o'clock. So just an hour after Lauren left her boyfriend's dorm. A 911 call came in. Motorists on Route 147 saw a young lady on the highway trying to flag down a car, and she appeared to be in serious need of help. Several people stopped and approached the young lady and called 911. She was totally naked, except for socks on her feet. Oh, gosh. She collapsed on the road and was said to have been taking slow, deep breaths and then eventually gasping for air and then, like, passing out. First responders arrived quickly and attempted CPR, but this young lady was unresponsive with no pulse or heartbeat. Oh, no. She was covered in abrasions and road rash and had suffered a single gunshot wound to her back. She was taken to East Alabama Medical Center and was pronounced dead. Because this girl was nude, she had no identification on her whatsoever, and no one knew who she was. Her identity was unknown. Hmm. Minutes later, at 927, 911 calls began coming in from Auburn University, which is five miles away from Mm -hmm. where this girl was found. And those calls were reporting a vehicle on fire in the Hinton Field parking lot. Police and the fire department responded to these calls and put out the fire, but the owner of the vehicle was nowhere around. It's like all these people were around, gathered about like, oh my gosh, there's a car on fire. And so police were like, whose car is this? Mm -hmm. No one knew whose car it was. So they ran the plates of the car and those plates registered back to Jim Burke in Marietta, Georgia. 
Mm. Police contacted Jim Burke, who told them that it was his car, but that it was being used by his college age daughter, Lauren. Police got Lauren's information and a description of her from her dad so that they could start looking for her and be like, your car burnt up. Mm -hmm. What happened? At the same time, Jim jumped in his car because obviously he's like, why is Lauren's car on fire and where is she? He started the two and a half hour drive to Auburn University. And as he was driving, he called Lauren, got no answer. Then he started reaching out to her mom who hadn't heard from her. He called the boyfriend, Sean, her friends. No one knew exactly where she was. Meanwhile, based on the description that they had gotten from Lauren's dad, police put together that the vehicle fire and the un- unknown lady that had been found on the road might be related. So they thought, mm. oh, this is probably his daughter, based on what he's telling us she looks like. Right. So they called Jim back and they said, come straight to the hospital. We need you to take a look at this person that we have found. And it was there that he positively identified the gunshot wound victim as his daughter 18-year-old Lauren Burke. Oh, man. Okay. So, again, Lauren was totally nude with the exception of socks. Mm -hmm. She had suffered a single gunshot wound with a thirty-eight caliber bullet to her left upper back. The bullet was fired at very close range, just inches from her. It pierced both of her lungs and then exited out through her right upper arm. Oh, wow. It was determined that after being shot, she bled out within two to three minutes. Okay. But when people found her, she was gasping. Mm -hmm. So where was this person? They were literally like right there at Mm -hmm. some point. Okay. She also had multiple abrasions and road rash markings from asphalt. Okay. It was determined that Lauren was not sexually assaulted. Okay. Mm Okay. In the remains of Lauren's charred vehicle, police found remnants of her clothing and a shell casing that matched the bullet that had killed Lauren. So they knew that whatever had happened to her had likely happened in her car. Mm. And because Lauren had been found five miles away from her car, they knew that her car must have left the campus at some point Mm -hmm. for her to be five miles away. And then been returned before being lit on fire. Right. When you first said that she was um, shot in the back, I was thinking like, whoa, she must have been running away. But clearly not. They said it was close range. Which, Mm -hmm. And they believe it happened in the car because the bullet was in the car Mm -hmm. or the casing. So because the car had been burned – any other substantial evidence had been destroyed. So they didn't know like, okay, is it missing? Like is her purse missing or is it just ashes? Mm. There was no fingerprints, any of that kind of stuff. Right. So now police are tasked with the job of trying to figure out who kidnapped and murdered Lauren and why. Mm -hmm. Lauren's boyfriend, Sean was the last person known to have seen her. So obviously he was questioned very quickly and very heavily but Sean was in his dorm during the Mm. time that Lauren was murdered. And he was like absolutely distraught. He kept saying that he blamed himself because he didn't walk Lauren to her car that evening. Like he should have, like a boyfriend should do. Michael, Lauren's study date was questioned, but he was confirmed to have been inside the campus library at the time. Mm -hmm. A memorial service was held for Lauren and over 6,000 people attended the Auburn University campus upped their security and began offering escorts for people to be walked to their cars at night. Our listener, Aubrey, who suggested this case, was attending Auburn University at this time, and she remembers what a huge shock it was to their like, sweet campus and like the whole community, the safe mm-hmm. town, like I said, were terrified. Right. A $10,000 reward was offered by the governor of Alabama and Lauren's murder made national news. Oh. Lauren's debit card was not found in her vehicle. So, but again, they were like, is it missing or is it just, you know, burnt up? Mm Mm-hmm. So on a hunch, though, police decided that they were going to put a trace on Lauren's bank account. Police learned that at 9.17 p.m., 
So just 15 minutes or so after Lauren was seen on the road, her debit card had been used to purchase about $15 worth of gas at a gas station on that same road. Okay. So, okay. So then later her debit card was used to buy gas in Atlanta, Georgia, which was two hours away. Right. It was then used at a Kroger in LaGrange, Georgia, to buy, like, groceries. Hmm. Police obtained surveillance photos of the person using Lauren's card, but all that was seen was, like, a grainy photo of a young African-American male. So he couldn't be identified. Nobody in Lauren's circle knew who he was. Mm -hmm. Nobody was like, oh, yeah, that's Lauren's friend so-and-so or whatever. It was just – and it was – they sent the photo to NASA to, like, see if they could get it enhanced because it just was a terrible picture. Like, be like Target. Yeah. Be like Target. Yeah. (laughs) It's so strange, like, gas in in Atlanta, then groceries in another – like, it just seems so weird. Mm -hmm. Okay. So her case kind of goes – a little bit cold. Like they're not Mm. stopping the hunt, but like they're, they, they have, they're just like, who is this random guy using her card? No one knows him. We can't Mm. figure out who it is. But on March 7th, three days after Lauren's murder, police caught a break. Mm. A man in Noonan, Georgia called 911. He reported that he was in the parking lot of a Walmart and was getting out of his car when he saw an African-American man approaching him with a gun. So he quickly like jumped back in his car and locked the door and watched as the man who was coming at him changed directions and approached an elderly woman as she was getting into her car. Mm -hmm. The man hit the older woman on the back of the head with a gun and forced her into the passenger seat of her car. Like at that point. Mm-hmm. That man then got into the driver's seat of the woman's car and started to like drive away. So the first guy who jumped back in his car to avoid this man was watching all of this go down. Mm-hmm. And he immediately calls 911 and he started following them. Like he was like, well, you're not going to kidnap this woman right in front of me. Wow. Wow. So this freaked the guy out. The guy who was, um, you know, had, was trying to take this woman, freaked him out. And so he jumped out of the woman's car and got into a silver Chrysler and, like, sped away. Uh, wait. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So he was like, oh, my gosh, this guy's following us. I'm going to get caught. So he just jumps out and gets in another car and, like, flees. Did the uh, guy that was following able to get that, like, license plate of that Chrysler? Of course he did. All right. He did because he's an amazing good Samaritan. Snaps. Mm-hmm. Be a good Samaritan. <laughs> be like Target, be a good Samaritan. So the police had the license plate number and they ran the tag and it came back to a 23 year old man named Courtney Lockhart who lived in Smiths, Alabama. Okay. Which is about 25 minutes from Auburn. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bolo. A be on the lookout was issued for this Courtney Lockhart and his vehicle. And within about 30 minutes, he was seen speeding and running a red light. Mm. So police tried to pull him over, but he would not stop. So oh there was gosh. a high speed chase for like several miles. And after a while, Courtney's car engine blew up. And so he was forced to stop. But when he stopped, he got out of the car and ran and he was to try to escape. It just doesn't make any sense to me when people do that. Cause it's like, it doesn't end well. You don't, you don't get away really. I mean, I'm sure no, every now and then. Get but, shot. Right. <laughs> like anyway, but he did it. They were able to catch him and he was mm-hmm. arrested when he was arrested and led out of the woods. He said that he was sorry and that he had tried to get help. That's what he said. He had no weapons on him at the time of his arrest, but he did have an iPod, which will be important later. <laughs> iPod. <laughs> a nano? or an iPod Touch. We've talked yeah. about iPod Touches, I feel like, way too much for some yeah. reason in cases. But Where does gun go? Did he leave it in the old lady's car? I'll get that. Okay. Okay. 
So in his car was a bloody shirt and 38 caliber bullets. Mm. During his interrogation, Courtney confessed to having been on a weeks long crime spree starting at the end of February. So this is March 7th. Courtney told police that he would rob people anytime he needed money for gas or food. And then in, when he ran out of money, he would just look for somebody else to rob at random. Hmm. Crimes of opportunity. Mm -hmm. He admitted to robbing a convenience store at gunpoint. And then a couple weeks later, he admitted to robbing a woman at gunpoint in the parking lot of a nursing home. The next day after that, he said that he robbed a young woman in the parking lot of a Sam's Club, forcing her to give him her purse by pointing his gun at her three-year-old son. Hmm. He also fully admitted to robbing and attempting to abduct the 72-year-old woman in the Walmart parking lot, which is how he was ultimately caught. Right. Okay. Admitted to all of it. I have been robbing people all over Georgia and Alabama. But hasn't said anything about Lauren. Not, not at this point. Mm -hmm. After searching through Courtney's possessions, police looked through the iPod that was found on his persons, and they saw many, many, many pictures of the young murdered girl from Auburn University. Oh, my. So they're like, this is her iPod. Right. He totally took her iPod. How'd he get her iPod? I totally forgot. I'm sorry. You could put pictures on it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> they were fun little gadgets back in I the day. Know, they were. <clears throat> so they go back into Courtney and they're like, listen, you've been super honest about all this other stuff. Why do you have this girl's iPod? Mm -hmm. And he began to fully confess to kidnapping Lauren and accidentally shooting her. Oh, no. All right. You should have so, gotten help then if it was an accident or dump, dump her at a hospital. Not and, and also, I do want to say the timeline of this is like all of these people that he is robbing, her murder was like in the middle of it. Right. So it's like he did things before. He was robbing people before he shot her mm -hmm. and then continued to after, right while also using her debit card right so it is possible that it was accidental since he wasn't killing other people during these robberies well all right we'll talk about it okay let's talk about who he is for just real quickly uh, okay let me tell you who this random man is mm -hmm. he was raised by a single mom he joined the u.s military in 2004 and was deployed to south Korea, and Iraq. During his time in the military, Courtney had a successful career. He was awarded combat medals and badges. He did see heavy combat and witnessed multiple casualties and suffered like a lot of personal loss there, including losing his sergeant, who he was very close to and saw as a father figure. Mm, okay. After leaving Iraq, he was stationed in Fort Carson, Colorado. He got married. He had a daughter. However, his friends and family noticed a huge difference in him after the war. He was very apathetic about everything, sort of an I don't care what happens to me kind of attitude. He began drinking heavily and smoking pot. In 2006, he got in an argument with some fellow soldiers in the mess hall, and it got physical, and he threatened a female officer with a gun, telling her he'd blow her head off. Mm. And he assaulted her. He was court-martialed and convicted of communicating a threat, assault, and the use of marijuana and was sentenced to seven months and then was dishonor dishonorably discharged from the military. Oh, man. So he moved back to Smith's Georgia or Smith's Alabama with his wife and daughter, and they moved in with his mom. He got a job as a foreman and seemed to be doing fairly well. Mm. But in the spring of 2008, just before this crime spree, the crew that he was working on began a job at Fort Benning, which is mm -hmm. a military base. Mm -hmm. And being around all of that military stuff and the noises like completely took him back. And he went to a very dark place and had very quickly was like on a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. His wife would find him like unresponsive, hiding in dark places, almost catatonic, like he couldn't speak. He became very paranoid and eventually wasn't able to work or like function at all. 
His hygiene began to suffer and he stopped eating and eventually began living out of his car. Oh, wow. So that brings us to him being questioned for Lauren's Mm -hmm. murder. Like that's how he got here. That's where he was during this crime spree and up until Lauren was killed. Gosh, that's just so sad. It's terribly sad. Courtney claimed that he went to the Auburn University campus to search for someone to rob. Mm -hmm. He backed his car into a space so that no one could see his license plate. And when he spotted Lauren walking alone to her car, he approached her with his gun and forced her into her car. She crawled into the passenger seat and he got in the driver's seat and drove off, keeping the gun pointed at Lauren the entire time. Courtney said that he asked Lauren if she had any money and she offered him $200 and begged him to let her go. He forced Lauren to take off all of her clothing, saying that he did that because he thought she would be less likely to do something crazy like escape if she was nude. Okay. Courtney drove around with Lauren for almost 30 minutes. The whole time, Lauren was telling him that she would help him. She said, I can help. I can find you a job. Like, you'll be okay. You can turn your life around. We'll figure it out together. Oh, my gosh. But Courtney told her over and over again that this was the end for him, that his life was over, and just continued to drive around, like, holding her at gunpoint. Like, what was your plan, dude? Right. Anyway. Oh, and, okay. I'm sure you're getting to my question, so I'll just hold it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Eventually, Lauren bravely tried to escape by jumping out of the car, and as she did, Courtney said that the gun accidentally fired, and she was shot. Once she was out of the car, Courtney said that he was so stunned, he didn't know what to do, so he just drove off. (sighs) He stopped at a gas station and put some gas in Lauren's car and then doused the inside of the car with gas. Drove it back to campus, parked it in the same parking lot where he had abducted Lauren from, took her debit card, some cash, and her iPod, and then lit the car on fire. (laughs) He then left in his own car and headed to Georgia, continuing to use Lauren's debit card several more times until he eventually ran out of money, and so he started robbing more people. Jeez. He said he threw his gun out of the car window during the chase by the police. Mm-hmm. That gun was recovered and matched the bullet that was that Lauren was shot with. Okay. Courtney claimed that his actions were a result of PTSD that he had suffered from his time in the military. Courtney Lockhart was arrested for capital murder during the course of a robbery, capital murder during the course of a kidnapping, and capital murder during the course of an attempted rape. Okay. He, said so that- he claimed that he did not intend to rape her. Right, right. right. Okay. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Mm -hmm. The prosecution sought the death penalty. His trial began in November of 2010. Interestingly, the judge did not allow Courtney's crime spree or his military discharge information to be entered into evidence. So the jury did not hear about the violence that he exhibited in the military or about the other crimes that he committed surrounding Lauren's murder. Which I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that like, I'm I'm not defending this guy, but that's unfortunate because clearly he has a mental issue because of everything that he went through. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you think the crime spree is evidence of that? Is that what you're saying? Well, they didn't. He, they didn't hear any of his military background. Well, yeah, I mean, they heard about some of it. They knew he was dishonorably discharged, but they didn't okay. know why. Okay, that's what I mean when I say his military background. But you okay. know what? Now that I'm, I think about it, I don't think they had anybody that was in the service with him testify at the trial. Which, right, would if they had known what he experienced when he was there? Yeah, I was talking more about that kind of stuff gotcha. than like, necessarily the crimes that he did. Like, clearly, he was like there was stuff going on that was caused by this and it got worse and worse and worse because he wasn't getting any help. Right. Well, no, they did have his family members testify and some people that were coworkers with him that Mm -hmm. saw him have a hard time when they were on the military base. They did testify to like his declining mental state. Mm -hmm. Um, 
their defense was completely centered around his mental illness, the resulting from PTSD. They claimed that Courtney could not be held liable for his actions because at the time he did not understand what he was doing, which is the legal definition of insanity. Mm -hmm. They claimed that Courtney did, did mean to rob Lauren, but that the shooting was accidental. And then again, they had testimony from family and coworkers. His wife testified all about the decline in his behavior in recent months and that he was showing very clear signs and symptoms of PTSD, anxiety, depression, paranoia, paranoia, all that. The prosecution claimed that Courtney had never been diagnosed with PTSD or sought treatment for mental illness and that his actions were premeditated, calculated, and that he attempted to cover them up after the fact by burning Lauren's car. They also claimed that it would take between five and 12 pounds of pressure to accidentally fire the gun that Lauren was shot with, and that there is no way a trained military person could have done that. Like, yeah, he was I see very that. familiar with firearms. He mm-hmm. had the gun trained on her the entire time. Nothing about it was accidental. That's what mm-hmm. they said. After six hours of deliberation over the course of two days, the jury found Courtney Lockhart guilty of capital murder during the commissions of robbery and kidnapping, but he was found not guilty of murder during the commission of attempted rape. Okay. This was based on the fact that he had no history of sexual violence or assault and that there was no evidence of sexual assault Mm -hmm. on Lauren's person. So they did not have enough evidence to say that he was attempting to rape her. Right. The jury was somewhat sympathetic to the mental illness that Courtney did seem to be suffering from. So instead of sentencing him to death, like they could have, the jury recommended a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Okay. This is where it gets interesting. Okay. During the sentencing hearing, the judge who presided over Courtney's case overruled the jury's recommendation and sentenced Courtney to death by lethal injection. Wow. How often does that happen? Fun fact. Alabama is the only state in the country where it is legal for a judge to overrule a jury on sentencing. Huh. Every other state in the country has deemed this practice unconstitutional. Yeah. I was going to say, what's the point of having the jury if the judge can just be like... Nope. Exactly. (laughs) As citizens of the United States, we all have the right to be tried by a jury of our peers. And for any one person to override that is against the Sixth Amendment. Mm -hmm. But Alabama is like, meh. Sixth Amendment. Amendment. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Jury of our peers, meh, meh. Yeah. The judge's reasoning, so this is interesting, for going against the jury on their recommendation was that the jury was not aware of Courtney's violent behavior while in the military or the crime spree and other crimes that he had committed up to and after Lauren's murder. But it was determined not to do that. By so him. That, right. By him. Right. He is the one who said the jury should not hear this information. Because Make up your mind, my dude. Make up your re- mind. Right. And the reason why he said that this information could not be brought as evidence is because he was never tried or convicted on any of those other crimes. So how can he be legally penalized for them? I mean, he did confess to them, but like he wasn't ever convicted of robbing those people or whatever. They had his word. That that's yes. But so that's why the judge was like, that can't be evidence because he's not been convicted of it. We're not, the that's- judge- Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, is the judge himself mentally stable? Because clearly he's like like two two different people in, during yeah. this trial. The thing is, okay, so I'm not saying that Courtney was a good guy. No, no. And I'm not no. saying that he shouldn't be punished. He definitely was a violent man. He terrorized innocent people. He murdered an 18-year-old girl mm-hmm, with right. nothing but a bright future ahead of her. They got it right by convicting him. Right. And getting him off the streets. I don't think he met the criteria for legal insanity during Lauren's murder. Mm -hmm. But I do think that he was dangerous and violent and clearly a disturbed person. Right. Agreed. But if we're talking about putting faith in our system to be fair, like, I got to call Alabama on Mm -hmm. it because, like, this this didn't go right. It doesn't feel right to me. I'm not an Mm -hmm. attorney, but, like, it feels wrong. But, yeah, I agree. 
So Courtney has filed several appeals regarding this constitutional violation, uh, ineffective counsel. During one of his appeals, a law student who was helping him found a medical record from when Courtney was still in the military. In that, it noted that he was showing signs of PTSD and he was prescribed medication for anxiety and depression. So the whole defense was based on he had PTSD, he had PTSD, and then the prosecution was like, well, no, he didn't because he never sought treatment for it. He right. never was uh-huh. diagnosed with it. Well, now he was. And now they can show evidence that he was. So all of these appeals have been denied by the state of Alabama. Mm -hmm. Courtney is currently 38 years old and is on death row at Holman Correctional Facility in Atmore, Alabama. I did read in one article that Alabama has a history of not executing prisoners who were in his situation where a judge overrode a jury's recommendation for sentence. Okay. So, like, he would be last on the list right. to be executed. Okay. Lauren was cremated, and her remains were taken back to Marietta, Georgia, where she grew up. Auburn University established a scholarship for freshmen majoring in photography in Lauren's honor. The family sought a $1 million lawsuit against Auburn University because – they had done away with their campus security a few years before Lauren's murder and just let the Auburn city police handle it. And their Mm -hmm. contention was that if there had been security on the campus, it would have been safer and predators like Courtney would not have been able to frequent it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in 2014, that lawsuit was denied. Lauren's family is in favor of Courtney's death penalty sentence. Okay. So Thankfully for them, they do feel like proper justice was served for their daughter, young, Mm -hmm. 18-year-old, beautiful girl. So sad. And that is the case of Lauren Burke. May she rest in peace. Yes. I hope she is resting in peace. Um, I do have – well, I mean, you probably don't even have, like, (laughs) the answer to this. But I don't understand how – if it's in the constitution that an individual state can just decide to not, but I'm not like up on how all that kind of works to not uphold that part of the constitution. So in the sixth amendment, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but it does say that we have a right to a jury to be tried by a jury of our peers, but it doesn't specifically say, and the jury also has the right to sentence. Does that make sense? So it's up to the states to decide. Well, every other state in the country has decided, yeah, that that counts too. That's part of it. Having a jury of your peers is part of okay. it. Okay. Okay. Except Alabama. Okay. All right. Now I understand. Okay. Second question. When the heck did she talk to the the study date during all this? Yeah. In the middle of them just driving around, her naked in her passenger seat with the gun, her phone kept ringing. And finally, he said that he was like, just answer it and make something up. Oh, okay. And so she did. Okay. And I also would like to just say, she was very brave. Mm, Yes, she was. Very brave. Like, it struck me that even when she was, like, terrified for her life, being kidnapped her reaction was still to be like kind and understanding. Right. Like, yeah. She talked with him and part of me thinks that's why he drove her around like that is because he mm-hmm. was like, man, this girl's being really nice to me. Right. She's letting me tell her about my life and all the problems and she's being super understanding. Right. Yeah. Gosh. That's like, I, I would be screaming my head off. Mm-hmm. Like, well, I, well, I know. Hey, she. <laughs> I know. And don't they say like trying to like kind of sympathize and like kind of be friendly to mm-hmm. like can sometimes save your life. Like, I mean, just like the girls a couple weeks ago that we did, or maybe it was last week. I don't remember. She was the two 12 year olds. One of them oh, was trying yeah. to say like, Oh, I like you so much. I wish you wouldn't hurt me. Stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. anyway, it's called fawning. I think. Yeah. I was going to say there's probably it's a, like a defense mechanism. Mm-hmm. I, in my head, know 
like that kind of stuff. But in that moment, I don't know that I would, it would come out. Like you said, I'd be screaming my head off, let me go, let me go. Right. Yeah, it is funny. It's a trauma response where a person develops people-pleasing behaviors to avoid conflict and to establish a sense of safety. Well, I mean, maybe it would be a response then. Maybe I would get to that point after initially screaming my head off. Right. Yeah, no. I would be literally screaming my head off. Mm -hmm. Like, he would let me out, I think. I'd be like, shut up. (laughs) (laughs) I do think that it's weird, though, that he wanted to abduct these people. Like, wouldn't it be so much easier to, like, shove them in their car, rob them, give me all your money, give me all your cards, Mm -hmm. give me your phone, give me your iPod. Apparently that was something he wanted. Mm -hmm. And then just leave and get back in his car. Right. Yeah. Why was that he would driving be. or trying to drive? Because he tried to do that to the 72 year old as well. Like, right. forced her in the car and started to drive off. What were you going to do? Like, what was your plan? Maybe he didn't have one. Like, for whatever reason, it made sense to him at the time. And I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm in this- an interesting case. He is a very disturbed young man. I do hope he's getting mental health treatment. In prison. Yeah, for sure. And I'm glad for the family that they feel like what what they wanted done was done. But I I mean, I don't know. But who knows if it'll ever actually get done. Well, true. Yeah, I don't mm-hmm. think they'll execute him mm-hmm. in their lifetime. Right, just yeah. just be my guess, but I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say what's the average timing on it. I mean, it's usually – so many years because there's so many appeals processes and it takes forever to like just finally get to that point. So right. he's lost all his appeals, right. which is really surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because for sure there, since they had that evidence of him, like with that medical note, like, yep. Well, yeah, shines and like, PTSD medication. Exactly. Like that close, mm-hmm. that's clearly an effective counsel. Like why mm-hmm. did your attorneys not find that and presented it evidence? Why did it take a law student during the appeals process. To find well, and it was part of the prosecution's argument. So now that like yeah. makes that part of their argument null. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So Alabama anyway. needs to give us a call. <laughs> we got some yeah. questions. <laughs> some questions for you. <laughs> Man, well, gosh. Um, a terrible, sad case. She was so young. Yeah. She had such thanks. a bright future. Yeah. Thanks for telling that. And- yeah. Bring it to our attention and Aubrey for Aubrey, right? For Audrey. Audrey. Sorry. Why do I keep. I, just, I do that too. My daughter has friends with both names and I'm like always getting them mixed up. Well, that's really funny because the f- friend that you speak of is probably the only Aubrey I know. And lately, all I've been oh, saying yeah. is Aubrey for Audrey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. We'll so, be all right. We'll be okay. Yeah, we'll be all right. But anyways, thank you, Audrey, for bringing that to our attention and um, sharing sharing it or letting us share it with the world. Yes. Thank <laughs> you for trusting us with yes, that story. Exactly. Well, let us know what you think about that. Check us out on social media. Go check out our merch. I don't know. I haven't done any merch lately, have we? No. <laughs> and if, if you guys are on Apple and you have a minute, and could write us a review. We would yeah. love that. Those are so sweet. And it helps us. It does help us. We, I mean, because for sure, like it, there's some sort of algorithm out there in the world that it makes us a little bit more recognizable and people find us and whatever. But most importantly, it's like, it, it's like sunshine. Like, yes. Phil, you saying that love cup. If you could see the text, it's like <gasps> new review, mm-hmm. new no. Or new rating, new rating, no review. Oh, bummer, no review. Yeah. Somebody just clicked the stars. <laughs> yeah. Which, which <laughs> you thank know. you for that also. Yes, yes, it is. That's also is great, but we enjoy and then lo- what people have to say. So mm-hmm. if you have a minute, and we go share ahead and go them on social media. Yeah, we do. Get a little shout out. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, go do that. Go check, click those stars and just write a little something mm-hmm. why you like us. And just always remember. The world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closet.